Hello and welcome. My name is Joe O'Mara. I'm the Head of Aviation Finance with KPMG. And on behalf of KPMG and Airline Economics, I'm delighted to be joined by Connor McCarthy. Connor is the CEO of Emerald Airlines. He's joining us today for the purposes of our Aviation Leaders Report. I should say we're recording this in early December. Connor, thanks so much for joining us. And um, before we get into the meat of the conversation, do you want to tell our watchers a little bit about Emerald? Yeah, uh, an, an airline born during COVID, I suppose I should say. Uh, we, we came up with the concept in May 2020. And um, the idea was to pitch for the Aer Lingus Regional Network franchise. So we won that franchise and we uh, won it in uh, February 21. And then we set about putting the airline together. Brand new airline, brand new license. And um, we got the airline's AOC by September 21. And we did our first commercial flight on February the 25th of this year. Uh, since then, we've introduced about one aircraft every two weeks. So we now have a fleet of 14 ATR 72s and we operate out of Dublin and Belfast, uh, Belfast City Airport, and where we're the largest airline today. And we're the third largest airline out of Dublin after Aer Lingus and Ryanair. And we've basically come through a tumultuous two years and now we're settling into trying to make some money out of this business. Very good. And can you talk to us a little bit, Connor, maybe over how you've seen demand develop over 22? You know, we've, we've clearly seen this pent up demand, restrictions ease. It seems we have a travel boon. Has that kind of followed through on what you've seen in 22? Yeah, it's been it's been really strong. We've seen uh, an almost uh, mousetrap effect where the, the demand has snapped back. And of course, we saw the, the problems associated with that sudden violent return to travel. Um, but it's on the whole, it's welcome. Uh, the demand is there, the, uh, f the money is there, and, and the people just have this innate need to travel and it's, they've shown it. Our markets are mostly the commuter type markets between Ireland and the UK. And we've seen a very strong demand there. That's been, it's one of the oldest air travel markets in the world. Um, whereas the Sun destinations did even better this year. Uh, but we've, we've certainly seen a very robust return to previous levels. And, and looking at, you mentioned some of the infrastructure problems, you know, I know nothing about it, but I know anecdotally, running an airline is bloody hard, right? So I'm assuming setting up one is extremely hard in this environment. Can you talk to me a little bit about those challenges of getting off the ground and running, and then just how those challenges were compounded with some of the airport infrastructure challenges we've seen? Yeah, it's, it's, not, all, it's not all negative. In fact, we probably ne never would have started Emerald had we not had a COVID pandemic. There'll be two reasons for that. First thing is the uh, incumbent airlines with existing operations uh, would have been considered by IAG Group as to be stable and established and with a reliable reputation. Uh, in many ways, they took a, a bet on uh, Emerald and its uh, leadership team on the basis of our historic performance in other airlines. Um, but we wouldn't have got going because those other airlines might have had stronger balance sheets and wouldn't have been as, been as big financial risk. So that, that's one thing that went in our favour. The other thing that went in our favour is a wide availability of not just aircraft, but also some really good skilled airline professionals, from engineers to pilots to cabin crew to operational specialists. So we were able to attract some really good talent, which a startup airline would normally have some problems doing. So we've been very fortunate in that respect. Um, I guess on the downside, you're looking at infrastructure that was not manned during the pandemic, airports, uh, third party handlers, third party catering companies. So they, they let a lot of their resources go. Um, and a lot of those resources found jobs in other sectors and didn't come back. Um, so that's, that's been a real challenge. We have seen an easing of that pain in the last few months, um, but for sure that, that was uh, airports and handling company uh, you know, performance were two of the big headwinds we faced in, in the infrastructure. And have you seen, you mentioned that's improved, if you assess it where it sits now in, in late 22, is it kind of where it needs to be? Uh, not quite, not quite. There's, there's, there's room to further improve, but the, um, certainly the very delicately, delicately balanced ecosystem of air travel, which relies on probably about 20 different activities from aircraft maintenance right through to air traffic control, that, that, has, uh, that got knocked completely out at the start 
that's largely returned. So I would think we're probably about 85% back to where we should be, but the, there's definitely a need to improve and, and uh, consolidate those improvements. And I also think the traveling public gave us a pass as an industry in 22 because they, could, they realized how decimated airlines were due to the pandemic and due to certain government actions. Um, so they gave us a pass in year one, but I don't think we'll have that pass next year. We have to be right. Yeah, I think that's fair. Right? It's kind of making sure you, you manage that pent up demand and don't let it slip away for reasons that maybe we'll come to in a moment. Um, you obviously have had a lot of growth in a very short period of time. As you look out into next year and beyond, where are you sizing up the opportunities in the market, Connor? Um, well, we're, we operate an exclusive fleet of uh, ATR 72 600s. So that's our model, that's our cookie cutter, and we're sticking with that one. Um, so we would look at routes typically within the 45 minutes to two hour distance. That's pretty much where we see our, our market, our addressable market. Um, so that leaves us with Ireland, UK, um, internal UK, and Ireland and UK to the north of France. So those, those sort of markets are relatively close in markets. They're very robust, they're very mature markets, but there are opportunities there. So we, we see enough opportunities for us to grow significantly next year. Um, we think the growth will probably taper off at that point. It will, well not completely, but we'll add one to two units a year. That'll be about it. And when you maybe size that up against your competitors, when you think about the Emerald offering, how do you position that? We've, we have a very easy competitor. Ryanair compete with us on 85% of our routes, so it's no problem really, <laughs> <laughs> said he jokingly. Uh, yeah, so probably the most uh, voracious and uh, competitive uh, airline you could ever be in a market with. So what we, we do, we focus on basically giving value for money as opposed to the lowest fare. Um, we focus on our costs, so we take whatever costs that the customer doesn't value out of the business, um, but we do put costs in specifically for the customer. So we, we do uh, have a frequent flyer scheme, uh, the Avios program from uh, BA and Aer Lingus. We use the Aer Lingus brand, we use the Aer Lingus lounge network, um, and that all helps our core market, which is um, the business commuter and the VFR market, the uh, let's say the, the high net worth VF, VFR market between Ireland and the UK and the short holiday breaks market. So there, there's enough in that market for both ourselves and Ryanair to share a, a, a decent sized market, which is very, very robust, very large and um, pretty resilient as well, as we've seen from the bounce back. So Connor, we talked there about a lot of opportunities in the market. I guess what we're also seeing is a lot of challenges as uncertainties in the macro environment. So we think FX challenges on the dollar, we think interest rates, inflation, oil prices. How challenging has that been for the business? Yeah, it's been hugely challenging. If, if you take it back to a year ago, um, it was before Russia invaded Ukraine, our biggest concern coming into the year was probably, will COVID be over? Uh, and, or will we get COVID Mark II? And the second biggest worry economically was, were we going to see in runaway inflation? Um, since then, of course, we've seen huge changes in the macro environment. So the biggest one for us as an airline would be fuel, where we've seen the price double. Uh, second largest would be the, pr the strength of the US dollar. We're largely Euro denominated airline with some sterling income and a small amount of US dollar income but um, a lot of our costs would be dollar denominated. So for a lot of European and I suspect Asian and, and non-US carriers, they're seeing a, a big hurt from the strength of the dollar. Uh, thankfully in recent weeks, we've seen the dollar come off its highs and we've seen the, the price of crude oil drop dramatically and the price of jet kerosene drop somewhat less dramatically, but still dropping. Uh, so. There's, there's some, uh, some headwinds that we're seeing abating, um, but we, we could have done without them in our first year, but they're there, we've dealt with them, and we're still dealing with them. And can I ask some of that's obviously, some of that's just speaking to the general inflationary environment. Coupled that with the pent up demand, have you been successful in passing on that cost to the customer? No. 
<laughs> <laughs> so we, while we while we have had uh, a very welcome return in the demand curve and and customer appetite to travel, um, we do compete with other airlines, and other airlines would have. Uh, maybe a no surcharge policy or they may have their fuel requirements fully hedged as in the case of Ryanair for example um, so we have to compete with whoever the incumbent is and that's what we've been doing uh, so while the market may bear some price increases and we've tried that on a an opportunistic basis through our revenue management uh, process we haven't been in a position to just add on a fuel surcharge or something like that no, that's understandable. Um, focusing still on the customer, have you seen, I know you are a, effectively a post-COVID airline, but you've been in this game a long time, Connor. Have you seen an evolution of any customer demands or preferences post-COVID? Um, not, nothing specific. I, I guess the, the, we'll probably need to wait another year to two years before we, we see it settle out because uh, there, there was such a, a return in, in demand and, and there was such an underlying demand for travel again that you know it's not unusual for people to have taken multiple trips, leisure included, uh, post-COVID that they wouldn't have normally taken. And I think we, we'll, we'll see that balance out over the next year or two as to where we are in relation to business travel, where we are in relation to what we call same day business travel, uh, which got badly affected this year, and uh, where we are in relation to short and long haul leisure travel. Uh, and Connor, maybe focusing on the asset side, you mentioned you have a you know, particular focus on, on ATRs, uh, your sole kind of uh, fleet at the moment. Can you talk us through your, your perspectives on that and, and what has driven that decision? Yeah, okay, so the first thing we did was when we looked at the available aircraft types for our addressable market, we wanted to offer convenience, we wanted to offer frequency, and we wanted to offer comfort. Um, so the aircraft types that are in that market are pretty much in the 50 to 90 seat category. Um, anything bigger and you reduce your frequency. So our customers like choice, they like choice of timing, they like a choice of when they, if the flexibility when they get to the airport, can they come back early, can they, can they slip it to a later flight, etc. So we want to have lots of frequency. And then we looked at the individual aircraft in that space and we found the ATR 72 with 72 seats was the ideal aircraft for us. It has a very, very low fuel burn. Um, it burns less fuel than a 737-800 on a per seat basis. So about one third of the fuel per trip. Uh, it has a really low uh, amount of carbon that it generates. It's very, very positive from a greenhouse gas effect because not only does it uh, consume less fuel, but it also doesn't produce a contrail. So again, you've got a nice piece of greenhouse gas uh, credibility there. Uh, and, and the other thing is it's a robust, reliable aircraft that's still in production and there were lots of them available at very low prices. So it, it almost uh, made its own recommendation to us. Uh, the jet aircraft in that category simply burn about 50% more fuel. They're just, not, they're just not competitive economically. No, and we, we might come to ESG and how important that is in a second too. Can you talk to us then about your financing strategy? So um, you might talk to us around own versus leased and the decision making in behind uh, where you landed. Okay, so we're, we're starting up with a brand new balance sheet. We're starting up with very little debt. Um, almost all our equity, we wanted to go into working capital so we could re-establish the root network as quickly as possible. Um, so we basically went for an operating lease model exclusively. Um, asset light. So we, we bought a lot of our own equipment, a lot of our own tools, a, lo a lot of our own rotable spares for the aircraft fleet. But other than that, we, we've gone with an operating lease model. Uh, and that's really worked well for us. There's absolutely lots of capacity out there, plenty of candidate aircraft, um, good lease terms and attractive pricing. Um, we did look at the you know, finance lease uh, option and it's at the moment uh, a lot more expensive. So why do it? And that perspective on, on leasing is very interesting and, and the approach you've taken. There would be some perspectives that the pandemic has probably strengthened relationships between airlines uh, and lessors around that flexibility of financing. Um, can I get your thoughts both from your own perspective and your interaction uh, with the leasing groups and maybe stepping back at a macro level, do you think that's probably going to be the case for more airlines into the future? Um, well, I suppose the first thing worth saying is that the, the leasing community were one of the biggest financers of, of airlines during the, 
the pandemic. Um, and obviously this would be for existing leases in place. With the government crackdown on travel and with the extreme financial distress that airlines were suffering, one of their biggest bills was uh, aircraft lease rentals. And they, they immediately met with lessors and lessors immediately responded to the airline community and came up with, with uh, new plans for, for working through this period. So uh, the leasing community, I think, should get a huge amount of credit for that. Um, I'm sure their balance sheets were as, almost as strained as the airlines they were dealing with. Um, but then again, there's a lot of pragmatism. There was very little else they can do. It wasn't like the pandemic happened in one part of the world and you could move airline aircraft elsewhere. Um, so they had to do something and their, their bankers had to recognise that too. So in, in many respects, it has deepened the ties between the leasing community and airlines. Um, and that should work for them for some time, particularly as airlines generally have had ravaged balance sheets and are not in a position to go and finance uh, new acquisitions of aircraft themselves. Yeah, I think that's fair. And that, that long term trend we've seen it kind of ticking over 50 and probably continue to tick up in the near term, as you say, with, with balance sheet challenges on the airline side. Um, can we come back to the ESG point? Um, can you talk to me a little bit about the challenges, you know, that the ESG is posing for the business at the moment, probably with a particular focus on the environment element. Yeah, well, we generally think about the environment when we think about this point. So let's just think about it for a bit. Uh, first of all, it's clear uh, the environment has not gone away and the climate crisis has uh, not only uh, been center stage throughout the pandemic, I think it's even got more prominence. So despite the, the huge impact of the pandemic, uh, what would have happened in the past was the nice to have agenda items um, were, were put on the back shelf. Um, I think most governments and certainly the world at large recognises we have a climate crisis and therefore we can't afford to put it on the back shelf. Um, so it's, that's been good. Um, the aircraft we've selected has is, is got one of the best climate uh, and environmental footprints that there is available today. So for example, we fly twice a day to Donegal um, Donegal is a four and a half hour drive from Dublin. Um, our aircraft burns about 2.5 litres of fuel per seat. Um, your average family saloon will burn about six litres. This is per 100 kilometres. We'll burn about six litres per 100 kilometres. So unless you're going to fill the car, you're better off flying. And not only will you save on the environment and save on your pocket, but you actually will, will also save huge amounts of time. You'll get there in 40 minutes instead of a four and a half hour drive. So there, there are some really good stories out there about what, how some aircraft and some air, aircraft journeys are actually good for the environment. Um, they're just not being told enough. Um, the other thing that just doesn't seem to have landed, and I think the aviation community has to take some of the blame for this, is that aviation accounts for around two to three percent of total global ga greenhouse gas emissions. So that's way less than the IT business, which is around 5%. Uh, it's, it's way less than road transportation. It's way less than construction. It's, it's less than landfills. But we, we, we still know we need to do our bit to bring it down and to, to uh, ameliorate the effects of it. But uh, you know, it is not the big bad bear that people sometimes dress it up as. Yeah, it's that challenge, isn't it, in kind of managing message and not what about it, but here's a bunch of good things we're doing, also sizing the problem, as you say. And, and there is, I think, a theme when I chat to people around, well, who owns the voice here? Is it IATA? Is it someone else? How do you put that message across a little bit better? Um, ESG on, on the negative side is obviously driving some regulatory issues. I know you guys face significant costs in relation to offsets. Can you talk to me a little bit about the, the regulatory challenges you have on that and just the cost it's pushing into the business? Yeah, it's quite significant actually. So um, the cost of, of a, a carbon ETS uh, was as low as 12 euros. It then rose to 20 euros pre-2021. Uh, and in the course of 2022, it has risen to about 80 euros per ETS. Um, just to put that in contact, context, uh, you need to buy in Europe, as part of the European uh, ETS scheme, you've got to buy 3.15 of those for every tonne of fuel that you consume. So that comes up to about 250 euros at the moment. Um, 250 euros is about half the price of a uh, a ton of fuel pre-pandemic or pre-Russia pre invasion. 
So in terms of the impact buying carbon offset has on our business, it adds a significant uh, multiple to the cost of fuel. Um, so what we're trying to do is obviously burn as little fuel as we can, look at alternative te uh, technologies, and look at alternative sources of fuel, such as SAF, sustainable aviation fuel. Um, and we, we hear a lot about the lack of production capacity, the lack of uh, major investment in SAF, the lack of government investment and EU investment in SAF. Um, but that's what's needed if we're going to offset our carbon emissions. Um, it's, it's a big economic driver and that's probably a right thing because uh, businesses react to economics. So even though it might be nice to do, if the economics say it's also very important to do, you find businesses more, more responsive. Uh, the challenge, I suppose, is if you're flying out of Europe to the United States, for example, you don't buy any ETSs. You get a free pass because the US doesn't support it. And I was about to say that, I think Europe's obviously ahead of the game from a regulatory perspective. And, and as you say, there's a bit of stick and carrot here, mm. but, but stick's the driver um, so. in, in a real way. Follow the money. This <laughs> is it, right? Um, so kind of really interesting conversation and, and great insights. Can I ask you, we've talked on loads of opportunities, but, but a bunch of challenges. As we sit here in late 22, as you look out into next year, what are your optimism levels like? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good, I have to say. Um, there's obviously a lot of global factors where, where we just don't know the answer to. Um, we would all love to see a resolution of the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, and who's, who's, who's to guess when that might happen and how that might happen. Um, that's really important for, for our world. Um, in terms of carbon, in terms of the environment, we see some really interesting technologies being developed. And what's, what's particularly good for us is they're almost uh, instantaneously adaptable to the ATR72 platform. So uh, the most likely one is, car is, is hydrogen uh, fuel, and the ATR72 could become a very, very efficient 50-seater run on, car on hydrogen. Uh, again, you'll be into your supply issues in relation to hydrogen. There's a lot of technological barriers have yet to be jumped, but the core technologi technological barriers and challenges have been overcome already. It's a matter of scaling for production, scaling for aviation, and, and all of the challenges associated with carrying liquid hydrogen on the aircraft. So I'm optimistic about that in the next 10 years. Um, generally optimistic in relation to the demand side of our business. I think people will and must travel. And I think governments now recognize the need to protect air travel. I, I do believe um, government policies generally uh, were harmful during the pandemic. Um, a lot of them were driven out of fear and ignorance because none of us knew what we faced. Um, but it became clear quite early in the whole pandemic that air travel by itself was, was not necessarily going to uh, exacerbate the situation. And yet the airlines and the airports were left closed. So hopefully government policies going forward will be a little more, uh, you know, knowledgeable, let's say, or knowledge based. Very fair and balanced uh, comments, I think, Connor. Um, on that mostly optimistic note, uh, I'd like to thank you for your insights today and wish you and Emerald a very successful 2023. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.